Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. In today's episode, we chatted with Jay from Australia, talking about Corsair Voidscard, as well as the Inquisition. Stay tuned for the conversation. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I was quickly getting a coffee from uh, McDonald's. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I had to be on a mute for a little bit. Are you driving right now? I'm in my car. I'm not driving anymore. Um, Yeah, I'm parked right next to the Mecca's. Um, Oh my goodness. Wait, the Mecca's? Oh, we we call it Mecca's. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything. Yeah. I've I've had brekkie before. Didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Did you have brekkie at Mecca's though? Did not have brekkie at Mecca's. When I was in Australia, I was trying to get other food, but the food in Australia surprisingly similar to America vibe wise. Well, the uh, official cuisine of Australia, well, some may disagree, but is Asian takeaways. So. Is it like um, Asian takeaways like the British have, where it's just like a bunch of food in a box? It's actually very authentic because um, China's Australia like and Sydney in general, it is actually the most diverse city in the world. So you'd be able to find just about anything. Nice. Well, I mean, Asian people have, and Asian people and Asian food have really kind of like morphed all the way across the world to adapt to everyone's different cuisines. So, and you know, I like, yeah, all, um, like all, all Asian food. Basically, I see a ham and chicken roll served in Sydney. What is this? What is this? This looks incredible. And nothing at all like normal Chinese food. Is this? A thing? I'm a bit, um, um, a bit salty now. I have to line up for my own home cuisine. Um, um, I'm Korean by descent, so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't. I really enjoyed Korean food out on the streets, but now you actually have to line up and wait. So, mm. Is the how's the Korean food in Australia compared to you know Seoul. Not, not um, amazing, but not not bad. Yeah, um, they don't quite do the. Um, so they have this thing called popcorn soup. I'm pretty sure you would have had some in New York as well. Um, and that's meant to be, uh, uh, it's meant to be open 24 hours in Korea. Okay. They, so they braise it. Um, there's this huge pot. They, um, mm. yeah, I've had, braise. well, I just, yeah. this is a pork soup, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, we were, I was in Korea like a year and a half or two years ago and had a lot of late night soups, you know, after drinking. <laughs> That's exactly what oh, we're Jesus, talking Jesus. about. Yeah. This, it's this always is, open. Um, this is an incredibly steaming. TTS picture that you've you've just posted to us. Whoa. Okay, well, I mean, we could get right into it. Right, Jason? Oh, yeah. We're here with, uh, you know, Jay the Sloth, part of the Australian scene and one of the upcoming Australian TOs. I think you have a tournament coming up in April, right, Jay? Yes, we do. Yes, we do indeed. I want Very to spread the good product. word to the Just Another Kill team listeners since Sydney, Australia is like one of our largest listener bases. So, you know, now's your time. Tell, tell our listeners a little bit about your upcoming tournament, just so that they know before we get into the festivities. Yes. Um, in Northern Beaches, there's a shop named Decked Out Gaming. Um, I have affiliated with the um, uh, manager of the shop to bring out six rounds, two days grand tournament with mm-hmm. a golden ticket as a prize um, to attend to World Championship of Warhammer. And and uh, this is only confirmed only recently. Um, partial payment to your flight ticket Whoa. is confirmed. Nice. We haven't actually decided how much it is going to be. It really depends on your participation to this tournament. Uh, so and part of the be player... Part of the player entry fee is going into that that eventual ticket. Yes, huh? yes, hey, that yes. That seems um, really, really cool. 
That is, is there like cool. options for like VIP packages to kind of like push that up a little bit? Kind of like, you know, Dota or some other online tournaments kind of, you know, have different tiers of tickets to help support stuff? I actually had a thought about it. We um, went both ways um, on um, coming up with the idea, but then um, to be brutally honest, um, we need your participation to make this all happen. So um, we set up at a um, single um, price ticket to uh, have the tournament. Um, just everyone to whether whether you want to come. Um, just for one day or both the days, um, the price is going to be same, be the same, for the sake of having making these prizes happen. So I was hoping the uh, the participants to understand um, why the decision was made on this particular bit, um, because it, everything is just so expensive in Australia at the moment. So um, um, having um, um, some tickets to be more expensive than the others. Um, it won't really. Um, I don't think it's going to make a great sense. Um, to uh, make people understand to uh, have the event at say hundreds and two hundreds of dollars. That's not going to be happening. So it's seventy dollars per ticket uh, for two days. Um, the, um, there is a uh, going to be a um, lot of prizes. Um, both for first, second, third place, and it's going to be a top cut event as well. So uh, the best of the rest, who is essentially the ninth, which should be visible on BCP, um, they will have uh, um, almost equal prize to not quite equal, um, similar price to, we haven't actually quite set the prizes um, what to get, but it'll be pretty handsome, yeah. You have an idea of uh, what kind of a terrain situation is going to be like right now? I assume you guys are going to take uh, the cues from the rest of the world and keep Beta Decima to the side for the time being, or is that going to be part of the tournament? No, it's going to be um, um, squad games, uh, LVO into the ducks, um, a map pack for one pod and the other pod is going to be playing full better decima and they'll swap each round so everyone will be playing on the same terrain set for that particular round all right so you're gonna have a uh, three or like lots of switches then it sounds like yeah, really um, there's gonna be a bit of administrative tasks to be done but i think um, i can manage it so um i think i, I don't think i've said it um very well so let's say better decima pod all play on better decima um first round and into the dark pod plays all on into the dark on their first round the second round they all swap the table to the other side so one pod will play two into the dark one better decima and one pod will be playing two better decima and one into the dark for the first day yeah that's gonna be quite a shake up because having a team that can perform well at into the dark and beta decima is really something that we haven't seen a lot of um i think that's really interesting uh how many people are you roughly expecting to have at the tournament or hoping for we can accommodate um somewhat over 40 but the tickets are now um set at 40 people um if there are going to be more people who wants to participate we do have enough terrains we do have enough tables to um accommodate the need um i'm just not sure uh, um um how many people are going to participate so um we'll we'll set it at 40 and see where it goes and this is happening by the time this comes out well this will come out on march 4th i think so you'll have a what, what day is it it's in april mid-april early april april 6th and 7th so you got about a month. So listeners in Australia, if you're interested or anyone in the U.S. who's visiting Australia in that time frame, now's the time to get your tickets. We'll have links in the show notes, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It'll, it'll be available. Um, well, so it sounds like Beta Decima in the dark. What teams are what teams is the team thinking are going to be good? You know, I could probably hazard a guess that Pathfinder is actually might be secret sleeper really good because <laughs> having played at LVO, I definitely won far more of my in the dark games than I did my open games. So far, um, I've been um, testing it out with uh, players playing intercession squad and I um, am playing Phobos 
at the moment because as we um been talking about it um Phobos is a lifestyle choice and in the end um all kill team players end up playing Phobos. They obviously have a big play in Beta Decima and so are the um intercession squad. I haven't quite got to check with the Pathfinders. Um Elite definitely have a better position in Beta Decima than um stay into the dark or now the norm um Octarius terrain set. Yeah, I especially the, the Phobos I mean, like, they've got all the tricks, the auto-pass jump and ignore obscuring and all that. And intercession is just, like, chunky and thick, and they can just jump out there and stand on objectives. Yeah, um, everyone's been just um, kept on playing um, rapid and and um, usually picks. I've been testing out um, um, people playing durable, hardy back again. Um I think they've got some big plays by uh, third turning point because they can just stand on the objective markers. And we play with uh, um, objective terrain um, rather than tokens or markers. And we've been talking about the one with the vantage, the one with the hatch as a piece. We specifically wanted those to be on the ground and provide the vantage to um, some, because there's like, maps with um two inches behind the center line that they can score vantage on it as well as it actually provides cover and if you're on the first level of gantry and if you specifically measure the vantage of that objective marker for the gantry it's less than two inches so it actually doesn't um blow the um, um conceal in cover so that, that's actually going to be one of the jank that we'll have to outline in the tournament. Um, we'll need to play some more games, yeah. Yeah, and this is a weird arrangement. This, this is when you're on top of the Beta Decima soup can and shooting down yes. onto a first level gantry. The distance is less than two inches, is what you're saying? That, yes. Does that vibe out with what I remember? Uh, I thought it was just a little bit more, but maybe I'm misremembering right now. Little, but another jank on top of that is that if you stand on the objective marker of the gantry, then measure that. To oh yes, yes, yes. Can, the objective marker is more than two inches. Of this. Interesting. <laughs> so, so objective markers to objective marker, it will always um um um. Um, you will always be treated as engaged for the um, part of the shooting attack. But Yeah, um, so for listeners who don't remember, vantage points don't actually do anything unless they are two inches higher than wherever you're currently standing. So because on Beta Decima, about half, I think a little over half of the objective markers are vantage points because they're flat round circles and you can stand on top of them. There is room, it sounds like, for you to stand on an objective marker and get the extra two inches to shoot down on someone, which is pretty funny. It's um I got I gotta I gotta um um say a bit of a shout out to um decked out gaming as well. Um they um kindly supported uh, uh six beta decima sets and with the community's help we'll have more than um ten beta des beta decima sets to play um um frequently and in the tournament. So we've been having um unlike um other part of the world, uh we've been quite enjoying the um the games played um here in Sydney. So it'll be very interesting. Have you had to... some of uh, the similar issues that players have had on some of the maps? Because, you know, colloquially from the one tournament that I've run in New York where we played all Beta Decima, five and six definitely got like a resounding do not like. Is it the same in Sydney or has there been a kind of a discovery of different tricks that help you do those Death Valley runs up the board with people who have vantage down on those two long maps? So what I'm, that's that's why I specifically separated the Beta Decima round to be um, um play individually because to play it competitively i personally think that it's a 2-2 game rather than a 3-3 game on primaries mm -hmm. so if everyone is to be careful avoid jump test and be each holding two objective markers by first turning point and prepare for second turning point then there are less janks to be um be aware of and less argument and disputes to be had because from second turning point it's 
proper shootout. Okay, so you're trying to avoid the scoring issue by having everybody flip flop between in the dark and beta decima. Does yes, that so mean that you're playing all of the beta decima maps, or are you rotating those maps through a couple of the better maps, quote unquote, like maybe maybe missions one through four, like every round? Or what's the what's going on there? That that was what my core core ask was. So map six is definitely out. Yeah, we are not going to play that map. Um, That's good. I'm sure everybody who's played on it yeah. <laughs> loves to hear that because having played on it a couple times, I can't imagine a melee team doing well there ever, even if you changed the melee teams a lot. But unless they change like yeah, how that map is actually laid out, like you could physically change the layout of the map, but play as as is mission six is is extremely rough with those two Death Valley runs <laughs> where vantage points watch over any position you can get to. I, I totally agree on that. It's 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 a bit of a um, no one can no one can get to the um, not even not even void dancers can't even um, um, get to the uh, um, the objective markers on the furnace unless they put a, a fortify um, on the uh, furnace and put another uh, put another barricade on their territory and 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 um, exactly stand on the midpoint at the start of the turning point, which is wide open. So it's not gonna be a um, um, great competitive map uh, mm -hmm. per se. So one, two, five. I I personally don't like one, but um, I'll have to play more of it and decide whether it's going to be played or not. Um, so what I am getting at is that. Better Decima, if you play it competitively, you will score significantly lower than um, Into the Dark Set or, um, let's or say, in open. the open. Yeah, yeah just because like, the split of objectives that you're realistically yes. expecting to get is lower. So you're adjusting that in your community by saying everyone is going to have to play the exact same number of rounds. So if it gets yes. down to a tiebreaker, everyone will have had the same chances to play on those maps, at least. That's which fine. I think That's is a fine. nice halfway point. So we're expecting that intercession or elites in general are doing better because on in the dark, they're big and chunky. They can stay in cover and they can pop out into rooms and get people. And then on beta decima, because other people are going to struggle with cover, the intercession and the Phobos basically have fewer operatives. They can ignore obscurity and they can basically take their shots is kind of what you're feeling at the moment. But who knows, right? This will be an interesting interesting judge call when you finally get there and see what actually happens because you've got some of the best players in the world you know alexa's coming i assume yes yes he, um he's already got the ticket so uh um yeah is uh ready. liam um, is is liam headed over as well oh well he'll have to um it's um decked out gaming is actually um liam's uh, liam shop um, yeah. So, and for listeners yeah, who don't know who I'm talking about, Alexa is the world championship winner. He won on cults. And Liam is the other person who came to the world championships alongside Alexa. He recently just won his return ticket to the world championships on novitiates. So maybe he'll be making a return or, you know, maybe he'll be on something else. Yeah, um, he's been doing pretty well. Um, and I, I was very happy for um, who I would want them to have um, uh, them representing Australia for World Championship Warhammer. So along with Sam as well, um, Sam's a great player. Um, he plays his vet guard very well. Um, and as a little bit of a, a poke, um, I would like him to play other factions better as well. But that's another story. And I hope they all do very well in World Championship Warhammer when the time comes. Seems like this would be a good time to jump into our niche tactics. Niche tactics. Um, you said that you had something that you wanted to chat about, and we've got uh, a picture here. Um, maybe we can we can yes. attach a link to this to for the for the listeners as well. It'll be up on our Patreon shortly, I assume, <laughs> or it'll have been up on our Patreon, you know, well in advance of this conversation showing up on the internet. Yep. So you can pop in and take a look. So this is a very very niche tactics. Um, it's specifically related to Corsairs playing in Into the Dark. And this has come up um, between um, me and uh, myself and Alexa's match where uh, he was trying to be within a millimeter of outside of the hatch wall so that he can lock my Corsair operative. I see it to, now. So you to, can't... To be can't. outside of three inches charge with deadly ambush. But we were obviously um, 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 furiously arguing about it. Then um, I, 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 I catted it up and <laughs> realized that the uh, tangential point in, um, of the engagement range of 28 mil and 32 mil does not allow the um, the gaps to be filled. So you can 
always make deadly ambush charge if you are less than an inch behind the hedge. All right. So the goal here is that if you are directly an inch behind the hatchway concealed, you can sit behind a door and your opponent can't move and shoot you because they can't get within two to get a shot off and they cannot. Yes. So basically you're, you're, you can always make a charge and there's like, yes, and there's yes. no way where the three inches will get you stuck. And then the yes. real question is whether or not someone can set up a position where they can shoot you through the door and they are drawing their cover line just through the access point. But it, if this is going to work, maybe in Australia, you guys play with the bottom of the access point gives you cover. We no 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 um um we use the uh, physical line um we we follow specifically to the rule book where the um the picture is drawn that um yeah. basically the um, access point is to the edges of yes. the door frame so yes. yes is there a way for someone to actually get a line where they don't where when you're standing at the center point that's, what, that's why I've said less shot. than an inch mm, so okay. the corsair operative will always be in cover so um. Maybe G Dub needs to. Um, I, I don't know. It's too niche for them to really care about it. But at this point, um, corsairs behind the hatch, while it's active or um, in concealed, uh, ready while it's concealed, it's invincible. Mm. So you're saying that with this image, you've already marked out where the access point is, so that there's no way to draw a cover line that just runs through the middle of the door frame. Because it looks like right now from the positioning of this object, you know, you're oh, right in the center of the door access point. There's no way to get like someone, you know, four inches away that's just drawing a cover line straight through the access point to doink you. I'll share another picture. <laughs> so the purple circle represents. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, listeners. This, this, is, this is how we stay the on least, the top. <laughs> the, this is by far the least accessible position we've ever been on for this podcast we are looking at a hardcore cad documentation trying to find a way <laughs> that this works all right so the blue circle is your corsair base i assume no no the purple is the corsair ah, um, and okay, blue okay. is um um let's say for the fun of it a scout hunter um, okay and however you sway your operative around um the hatch is um depending on the um, manufacturer's um um allowance it's going to be oh, 74 millimeters <laughs> okay all right so i think i can agree with the i think i can agree with the core argument here so you're saying that if you yes. have two corsairs on conceal behind a door you can block off people from flipping to the other side and charging through right so and you can always the, one, it. the circle is the movement circle mm. is the movement of uh, these following purple circles um um it represents the movement of okay. one corsair operative so it will oh, right. never be in line so, of sight un, it will have the visibility for for yes. anyone who can't follow this conversation unsurprisingly corsairs on in the dark very powerful especially with the new deadly ambush rule so this is like you set up a deadly ambush you set up a corsair on a door for a deadly ambush and it is impossible for someone to open the door or approach the door without being deadly ambushed exactly yeah. so it fortifies that that um exact idea that um people might argue that if i am here then i won't be able no they'll always get deadly ambushed regardless of any other rules. Yeah, I suspect that this is one of those situations where just like a Wormblade Locust or a couple other things where your opponent sets it up and you either have to take the choice of avoiding it or running into it and then dealing with running into it, right? This is not a... You, there's no real way around the deadly ambush on in the dark, right? Because the three inch bubble is so massive. The reason why, yes, uh, the reason why talons are so good on in the dark is those three, those five three inch injury bubbles from the Sisters of Silence basically just dominates every single objective across the entire board, and that's really where oh, yes. the custodies are very, very strong in the dark. So similar to that, because now corsairs have this new three inch deadly ambush rule where you can pop out of conceal to go hit someone. You know, on in the dark, your corsairs are way more dangerous around doors corners and basically anywhere where you can park a dude and not get so shot. there is no way um um courses um can be uh four two in any scenario in any sort of um, um asymmetric symmetric itd maps um um there is always going to be an opportunity for at least courses to be having three primaries turning point one so it's it's very strong um courses actually um i think it's an 
Alexa and I were having this uh, conversation about this as well. Um, they're probably the uh, the top team in Into the Dark at the moment before the ballot as data slate drops. Have you considered five assault intercessors and a doom bolter running at you though? It's in the end, it's a dice game, and neither of them really have a good rerolls, right? So it's it's probably uh, going no, to be like a dumb the, game. The intercession have other good with... rerolls. An intercession have good rerolls when they go. That's combat. one one balance reroll on chain sword. Um, so some six uh, dice, take... six dice on threes means that you're generally going to hit like three or four dice. Like that's not that crazy on threes, right? This is when that this is when we um, meme about it and yell outcast, but then <laughs> it's yeah, it's not really going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, buff actually helps. It helps, but uh, we we're not getting. <laughs> Yeah, since we're since we're on niches for Corsairs, obviously yes. this is a very powerful niche tactic. But there are other things that are good about Corsairs. You want to talk through maybe one of the other scenarios where maybe like a shredder might get a blast that people aren't ready for just because of the way in the dark works and the way that Corsairs work. So the um, operative that uh, is quite critical um, in playing around um, into the dark specifically um, is the Wayseeker. Um, the psyker who will be wall folding, um, in other words, um, teleporting other operatives. And one real threat to Corsairs in Into the Dark is the three inches indirect, which behind the hatch, it can be covered by, um, deadly ambush. So it doesn't have to be a melee operative. Everyone has a power sword except one guy who's the, um, sniper. I always give him the knife, but. And the psyker. The psyker's got a bonk stick instead of a power sword. Oh yes, that uh, um, it's a four some, something, isn't it? I think it's four dice on three, three, three five or something. It's not great, and it's got stun probably. Yes. Sounds right. The bonk stick. So the usual um, play we have is the plasma grenade is armed by Shade Runner, but the Shade Runner we talk about the Alpha Strike. I think the last episode when Alexa was on it, um, he was talking about talking about it and not throwing it. That, mm-hmm. That's already in the play. And um, we go a little further and um, likely you warp for the, uh, um, um, either the duelist or the um, fate dealer, the sniper, because fate dealer is always with the equipment super concealed that the only threat they have is indirect grenade, which also back again, which is always within the um, 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 deadly ambush range. Okay, yeah. So basically the ability on Corsairs to dominate with deadly ambush means that opponents have to make sure they're popping the trap with someone who can deal with the trap, right? And then because you can have multiple chain activations and teleports, it means that you can actually treat some long range threat on in the dark, specifically like a four APL operative, because you can have the psyker flip a person, get closer, then have the leader open a door, chain activate someone else. And then that person can now move dash free, open a door with the light fingers and then do a thing, either the shredder or a plasma grenade. Yes, yes, yes. So those are like with this, with this deadly ambush buff. Yes, Mm -hmm. very, very powerful. Um, um, with this deadly ambush buff, um, you can set up your operatives as if, on one side at least, as if you are going to win the initiative. And if you do win the initiative, then um, the, the 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 leader and the uh, duelist can obviously just open the hatch and start blasting. And that happens every game if you do win the initiative. And if you lose the um, initiative, then you're safe behind the uh, deadly ambush cover. So it's it's very and this powerful. Is, um, this is for like a turn two kind of like alpha at this point now, right? Because you can yeah, use yeah, deadly yeah, ambush yeah. on turn one to stay very safe, control points, control space, maybe even keep an opponent off of one of their points because, you know, if they come up too far, they're in range of getting AP two'd or shredded with lethal five. And then on turn two, now you're fully safe behind your threat of activation. That's it. So what actually happens in the game is that uh, um, we're all holding three objectives each and nothing happens because we are now aware of this, that we don't even bother to. Um, if Corsair starts to move forward, then um, um, the opponent will just let them because there's no way to get around it. It's better to just go around the other side of the map at this point. All right. So 
you haven't run into situations where people are like throwing good melee operatives into range to kind of like force a deadly ambush and make it force you to spend the CP? Um, if we're talking about uh, um, casual um, games with uh, new people, then obviously it's played very differently. I'm not going to sit behind the hedge and, and explain in a paragraph that why you can't do such things. Um, this is between um, the top contenders who apparently is the... Um, um, the team that I am always playing with. And it's, let's say, Alexa, Liam, Emma, Sam, Christine, and, 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 um, I must have um, missed out on some names, but we will always discuss, um, as if, uh, we're actually, um, I'm memeing about this as well. Um, have you seen Key and Peel's, uh, Mexican standoff? I have. I think I have. I've yeah. seen that, yeah. Yes. Um, so it becomes that sort of a conversation that, you knew, I knew, you knew, I knew that you were going to do that all along, all along. And then um, it becomes a stalemate. So somebody has to make a move and um, um, it becomes, it's it's still a casual setting, but uh, um, it's a very different uh, casual games that um, you could think of um, compared to some of the learning intro introductory games that I do quite often. But no one will um, bear to charge and rely on the dice to because um we are not very good at rolling dice apparently um, um no, no one seems to do that very well <laughs> it's it's so rolling dice is not my perks and that that's actually one of the main reasons why i actually um um started organizing tournaments and events than to actually play the game because i'm very good at, good at rolling ones and um that set me off from um contending for the golden ticket it, in oceanic circuit final um i drove a couple of guys i drove with a couple of guys um to melbourne it was a thousand kilometers i had a, it was a long day and i, I was um, sleep deprived and all that but regardless of all that um i started playing with my hopkins against a legionary and i had a perfect opportunity to move dash and shoot my one inch super crack grenade on twos with all the um all the fixes huh? uh, everything all everything was fixings. available i rolled one crit and three ones and obviously this nurgle legionary had implacable and nothing happened and <laughs> that, that was <laughs> for, the start of it and yes. for for listeners who don't know a thousand kilometers 600 in freedom miles <laughs> <laughs> So th that was my first round. Um, I rolled like um total like twenty ones in that game. Nice, and nice. That that, yeah, that um, definitely puts a damper on some of the competitive spirit sometimes. Yes. yes um. So uh, well, Liam and Alexa, they were um, and Sam as well. They were all um on their buy round um because of the number of the uh um contenders um were not quite in even numbers and there was to be no ties to this particular event that the top five contenders had a buy round um that's that's how the tournament was played so i'm not going to argue about what's uh, what was what would have been the best outcome but um that set me and um, so they already already have a win um mm -hmm. on this um on the table so and it sent me off to um 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 with the, another um, event organizer in Melbourne, um, and shout out to Levan, we had a great game, man. <laughs> um, so it became a very uh, um, um, fun, eventful uh, um, tournament that I always um, wanted to enjoy, but um, I was always um, caught up winning the game rather than enjoying the uh, event itself. So it got me thinking quite a bit after playing with a lot of the Melbourne players too, that uh, maybe I needed to um, focus more on um, organizing events and bring up the spirit of the game rather than just uh, um, play to win. So that, that was actually the uh, core reason why I got to get into um, organizing events. Yeah, I think that's definitely a big part of why me and Jason are even doing this podcast, right, Jason? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and like in every scene that's going off, there's there's someone that's like running the events, and without that, the scene isn't really gonna pop off. So that's a very important role, and it's very admirable. Um, yeah. So thanks for doing that. 
How have you felt like the community response has been in Sydney for you? You know, obviously you're not the first Australian tier we've had on here. We've had bands on, you know, what kind of, what do you think is making the difference between your two different TO scenes? Or do you feel like there's a little bit more kind of like spirit of togetherness on all the scenes in Australia at the moment? So I had a um, um, good thought about it. And um, so Sydney is geographically divided in, um, north and west. So north to city is quite accessible. West to city is quite accessible, but not quite west to north. So um, um, it the players grew um, into particular shops and it really came down to um, what the organizer was focusing on. And Vans, obviously, um, he does very well. Um, 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 putting people um, um, on their list and, and um, introducing the game and so getting them on board. He does a very good job at it. Uh, I'm going to be criticizing myself for um, I may be seen as too sweaty for um, um, new players, especially um, people who come up with particular reasons per se um i just want to roll some dice and have fun that that's that's how you hear that quite often mm-hmm. and but the this is another thing that i wanted to discuss as well that you you would say that and you bring your commandos and this is pre-nerf and you triple git and you move dash and <laughs> i mean you move and throw your dynamite then this is meant to be their first first introductory game. You haven't got your core rules down set yet, but you know enough that this is a very strong play. Then and by all means, I'm I'm okay with that. It's on at this point um, that that you want to win, right? So I think that came across as a um, um, bit of a friction I had with some players when I was getting them on board. Um, some people obviously stayed and um, are very sweaty and very competitive. Um, some people turned away because of the games they found. They, they didn't get to do what they wanted to do, I suppose. Um, but in the end, I think Kill Team is inherently a competitive game. And hobby and the, uh, the lore side of the things, it's all great um, in nature. But I do feel that if you want to hang out with the community and enjoy the game itself. I think there's a, there needs to be a good distribution of wanting to be better and wanting to win. And I think I can provide that opportunity if you come to um, my setting around in the northern um, areas in the Sydney. So that, that's what I really wanted to tell to the um, audience who will be listening to this podcast. So you were saying that you were the one playing commandos with the triple sneaky get or saying people no 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 people I'm, like I'm in the their opponent. first game they're like oh i want to like yes. play and they're just doing this thing because they've heard about yes. it and they wanted to do it and you're like all right yeah, well, it's, 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 you're gonna go a, in i'm gonna take the kid gloves off yes yeah yes i think i think yes. i to be fair i do think that kill team is definitely kind of a more inherently competitive game than some other stuff that games workshop produces just because there are more re-rolls and there's more ways to adjust fate so like if you know what to adjust you're going to get more value out of it long term and because things are back and forth there's a lot more interaction that you need to pay attention to so like making sure that people are measuring correctly at the world championships i was surprised at how important it was just because not everyone is taking those measurements as seriously as some other players do you know making sure that measuring implements are on the table and not floating above the table that actually makes a huge difference and those are like things that not everyone caught right away which i think is kind of interesting yes 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 yes. um Uh, that said even if kill team is very competitive there's still room for players to like go around and just roll dice and have fun but I do know that there is kind of like a knowledge gap that happens where if you don't want to interact with the game in the knowledge gap where I have to like figure out what my opponent's doing, I have to figure out what my team is doing, the game can quickly kind of like fall away from you if you're playing against people who are doing that. So there is a balance to be made. And there's also like different player groups to encourage, right? Like I know in my scene, the narrative scene is just as vibrant as the competitive scene because some people just they actually do just want to hang out, have the Doom Bolter run around and delete people. And, you know, maybe the Doom Bolter is better than I expected because Jason did pretty well at LVO. 
So there's there's oh, room yeah. for different kinds of strategies. It's not always about like the, what is the most meta and most competitive, but you do have to play the game and try to actively get better if you do want to see your win rate go up. You can't just play kind of on autopilot with a meta list because everything that's good is the meta list in Kill Team. Unlike something like Age of Sigmar or Warhammer, where list building matters far more than some of the actual play sometimes. That's right. I I absolutely agree. Yeah. So what do you think? So you think that you're you were able to provide that kind of like sweaty but friendly atmosphere yes what, yes. what um, kind of things um, my, my do you advice think to everyone doing? yeah what kind of things do you think that you're doing to help push that along so that you know other tos who are thinking about spinning up their scenes can hear what you're doing in australia and kind of take take a little bit from it what would you tell some of the newer tos that are coming up so i tend to um um i tend to give blatantly untrue and unrealistic advice when people are struggling with their game let's say two new players are playing against each other then um they um they get into analysis paralysis and i just tell them like you move you dash and you shoot and roll sixes and then that that's it and that's how you win the game i'm liam here um that's how he won his gt alexa here he that's how he won his golden ticket he rolled a lot of sixes and it's rending, so it becomes two crits. And yeah, um, and those sort of conversations um, eases off a lot of the tensions that people seem to have um, when, especially when it's two new players playing against each other and it becomes the sweatiest um, game that you will ever see because they, both of them, they don't know enough to get around the problem they are facing on that particular activation so rather than to and when i do my introductory game myself as well rather than giving them um um paragraphs after paragraphs of rules i tend to um pick on what he or she may be doing wrong on movement let's say um they're moving um uh they're saying they are moving two inches, but they're doing it in the air with the gauge. So they um, say they'll be moving like eight, ten inches. Then rather than say, no, you're wrong, you're moving too far. I've learned this from um, other um, um, tournament organizers as well, that we should measure this together. And I think it's a little too far. Let's um, measure this together. And as you can see, he needs to be one inch out of the uh, corner to make that movement. And I'll usually just pick out on what they can't do and ask them to make their own decision. And I usually am um, pretty patient with their activations and such that a learning games usually hangs around three to four hours. Um, but the next game they play, then they'll play um, a lot better and a lot faster. And um, that was the same with um, everyone, really. Um, even even Liam and Alexa again. And um, Sam was already um, um, available and um, ready to play in the tournament when I met him for the first time. So um, there are a lot of the others that um, who got to be in that particular spot where they started really slow and now they are considered as one of the top contenders representing Australia. So I look forward to people to come to um, all these events, not just the grand tournament. There are other two events that's to um, happen, not particularly organized by myself, but um, 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 Emma and Chris, they are also organizing um, 2v2 events uh, next week. And there is a four rounds tournament in Castle Hill RSL um end of this month it's already march here so um so there will be plenty of events for people to um, learn enjoy play win so um it's really for an individual to ask questions and every one of us who's in the competitive environment will be there to provide the support because we want more players yeah and everybody wants you want everybody to find a friend to play their favorite game with right and that's really what tournaments are about getting out and playing exactly. games with people you haven't met and who might be your friends you just haven't met them yet that's exactly it. so you know australia's got you know, pretty vibrant scene. You've got a couple of different TOs. You've got, you know, bands doing large tournaments. You're doing a large tournament coming up. What? And I think there's also a world team championship team going. It sounds like you guys are have two teams. Alexa's heading up one and I assume Liam is heading up the other. 
I think they are all one team. Um, I'm actually quite out of this because um, I'm, they left me out because they know uh, so this. This is with too good with each other that a lot of the things are actually not said. So they just um, didn't even consider me um, as part of the team because um, I, I'm actually pretty busy and I got a family to take care of as well. So I'm like, no, Jay's out. We're gonna we're gonna um, look for other players um, in Sydney, and well, you can come and you can come. So we don't have um, what is it the qualifying rounds for WTC um, because that that actually is um, I don't know if it's a problem, but um, yeah, best so- player. Proven best player is going to world um, team championship. I don't think it's really an issue. Yeah, yeah that's good. I mean, so Australia's got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your, like some of the big members of your community. I know we've mentioned Alexa, Liam, Sam. These are all people that are going to the world championships. But there's probably other people in the background that are helping Jay, the sloth, help build up their tournament scene. You know, anyone else you want to call out? Hometown heroes, as it were. I'll, I'll start from people who's furthest away um um jason um jespoon the jason from um but he's actually australian but oh um, yeah that's right just um, jespoon <laughs> from you know yeah, he was building a scene in, in canada yes yeah yes yes um um i need to give him a shout out and um and so is ace um helping me um build the community i'm using the spanish model to um build a community all together um thanks for all the advices and uh everyone in the team skill issue um you've been all been great i uh well and specifically Raphael for naming the team skill issue it's been um it's been a great journey and i'd like to carry forward with all the uh, um challenges to overcome so all the good thanks to everyone about it I did everyone in. I did say everyone in um, skill issues, so they they know who they are. I don't think mm-hmm. I have to name the names. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I mean, we do we do want to make sure that we do our operative showdown this week, right? And oh, it yes. sounds like you know, in our pre-show notes, you talk about Inquisition agents, one of the famously teams with the most operatives. So, yes, Jason, you want to kick us off a little bit? Yeah. So for the operative showdown, operative showdown, we like to compare different groups here i mean there's a lot of options to compare with inquisition because of all the the different support choices and then like once you do go into the support choices there's there's combos there um what are your your top two um support slots oh i'm going to be very contentious here because i don't play like the others with the inquisitorial agents i take infiltrate as the pack ops oh okay pray tell pray tell tell us more and look i i need to give a bit of a background so um the tournaments that we've been having i'm a um i'm a fine purveyor of chess clock but not a lot of the tournaments involved chess clocks and if you play Horde teams in general. The opponent runs out of time, but we can't prove that. So I always was um, locked out in this um, opponent's analysis paralysis and score um, comparatively less than my um, other contenders. So what I come up with was to grab infiltrate and score early so even if the game stops um in mid um if if, if, a mid turning point then i'll have sufficient points to advance into the next round and if you bring gather surveillance and stock target with right support you can actually get ahead four points three points four points ahead of your opponent and one of them is going to be um, um, breaches and Kasakin. But here's the caveat. You bring the cat. So with the cat um, and a smoke grenade, you throw your smoke grenade somewhere randomly and you assign gather surveillance as your cat. 
and it's people will see that all oh, cat is going to because it moves eight inches that people will think oh he's just gonna move into um the smoke to avoid all the target so some people will go into the smoke to prevent that some people will set up around the smoke to prevent that as well but that wasn't it. That was actually I was what I was trying to do was um, um, get a surveillance in other part of the territory and stalk target whoever is near the smoke. So, <laughs> so this, is a hilarious, this is a hilarious mind game level. I have not even considered. <laughs> I, I did this a lot. Moment. How many times does this work, Jay? Every game, I um, um well, <laughs> I was I was fighting for a podium on the not this one but the last GT with this um. Uh, I'm, uh, I I know I'm a bit arrogant in that sense, but I'm all right. I'm all right. I, I do a lot of things that no one really expects. Um, I even casually, I play headhunters, assassinate target and no witnesses and maxim. So <laughs> you, it's you just such like, a flex like, if you do score it though. <laughs> look, Jason does yeah. this kind of stuff too. He was doing assassinate target for like months. Oh yeah, it's oh, been yeah. one of my so favorites. It's 100% of... the best tech up you can take for, um, into Storyline Agents, yeah. You just need to move, dash, shoot, and kill. It's easy as it gets done, yeah. Okay, so you're um, taking the Navis Cat unit so that you can get the 8-inch move for for gather surveillance with it somewhere else, and then stock target for the smoke grenade. So the smoke grenade is a misdirect because people expect the yes. cat is going to go there. So they run a dude to block the cat from doing some other stuff, and you get the extra value of now your opponent's trying to interact with your cat unit and stop some other stuff, but you're actually misdirecting them. So you're using um, the Navis Breachers with Infiltrate, which is not standard at all. So tell us a little bit more no. about your other you know, operative choices, because it's not just a cat, right? Cat, there's probably other stuff that you're doing with the Breachers that maybe some people aren't expecting if this is going to be your your line of attack on a overall game plan. Yes, um, the, uh, well, now that Interrogator and uh, um, Skullbook is going to be GA2, that um, I have enough activations to swap books around. So one thing I can do is usually the Interrogator as the uh denun I always get this wrong. Basically the offense book where you get an extra yes, die yes, when you yes. go into fight. So it's five dice on threes for everything or four dice on threes with his power sword. Yes. So he's a good so, he's another good operative. But if you're tossing the yes. book over to the skull, where what's what's the game plan here with your with your uh, trick play? So this smoke is on that we've just talked about. Skull goes into the smoke. Okay. And somebody is outside of the smoke. And Navis last volley will have seven attack relentless on four plus. Oh Jesus! With relentless, yes. So it, it, it so turning point one is a lot of throwaways, and only operative who can really shoot is Navis last volley. We know that the um the servitor is not going to shoot anywhere unless the um terrain provides some sort of advantage on their deployment. So it takes a lot of setup. Um, sometimes even I forget what I get to do. That, that's the so that's the problem with inquisitorial agents. Um, you are you are your own worst enemy. Um, but uh, the book people might um think that he's just there to be next to the servitor to provide one less dice. That's not true. You can always use it to um be part of the because it flies. Unfortunately, sure it only moves six inches. Um. Having the book, um, it can you can always out activate the opponent, and you can always be near two inches by turning point two. It's just when to activate this guy and when to make the shooting, and um, this brings up to um, another um, operative um, in other support team group, which is Kasakin and the Recon Troopers' new um, um, new ability. It's you can use that to shoot plasma cannon in impossible angle now. And this time the book will disintegrate with the, um, um, the uh, other operatives. Um, but it's uh, book is going to go in, in the game. It's, it's going to die. So you can always, so it's, it's about having the interrogator and the book to have the very typical setup and then swapping the book. That's really important. Like no one really does that. 
they always um um go on their separate ways to like book does this book thing and um um I mean the the skull does his skull thing and interrogator moves and dashes and shoots and then dies the next activation. But you can always be cagey about it and um you also it all you I it's hard to just talk about one operative because you always need to put it into a combination. Um Cassa can can with the recon trooper, they can almost do into the bridge. You'll spend a lot of CP about it, but um 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 I did that as a meme play, everyone going up on the vantage with the CPs and start, started shooting at the um light covers. Um it really depends on um what the map is. If it's anything like um open maps that uh we are practicing on in um Australia, you can spend CP to play extra scouting plus the recon trooper to make the sniper and the uh um servitor and another AP2 weapon of your choice to be on the vantage. And they also have a um it would come with a fortified though. Um so have them all um fortified fortified under um um next to the vantage and um the where where we um go with this is that we don't make the shooting. We just prevent the opponent from advancing into their objective markers. So there is a lot of um um area denial with inquisitorial agents um with all this setup playing and once that's achieved, then you can infiltrate as much as you want. Yeah, so let me just re recollect all of that because that's actually a pretty yes. good line that I don't think anyone has ever. I don't. I haven't heard anyone talk about too much because most of the attention, as far as inquisitorial agents goes, gets really focused in on the breachers and vet guard because you get yes. six activations and lots of good abilities. But right now we're talking about how the recon trooper with his recontour kill zone allows you to get a free recon action because you took yes. the recon trooper. That means that you can also take an embedded agent, which is your one CP ploy to get a repeat scouting option or or do your scouting option after you see your opponents. But in this case, because you get a free recon, now you can double recon and you can play embedded agent again to get fortify. Yes. Or actually, no, you can just start with fortify and then you get yes, two yes, recons. Yes, yes, and now yes, you're yes, yes. if your open board is one of the ones where some midline objectives are actually covered by vantage points then now your embedded agents, you can sacrifice two shooters to basically give you cover on top of a point. So if your opponent comes out too far, you nuke them. Otherwise, now you have two guys guarding vantage points that everyone else on your side can use safely. And those are like your last two objectives or last two operatives. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good. That's actually a really good point that I don't think anyone has ever really talked about. And Kasserkin do give you the flexibility on the team of double comms, which is not a thing the team normally has. Oh yes, and you know, always, as Kasserkin has shown, double comms is very good because you can either backload APL because APL, if used after an operative has already gone, allows you to keep that APL until its next activation. Which means that if you do it at the end of turn one, you can actually set up four operatives to have. Or APL basically going into turn two because you have two that have already gone and then the following turn you put another two on two that haven't started yet so you have four operatives ready to go with plus one APL which can be a lot to deal with against some teams which cast can get lots of use out of this and inquisition agents can also use are there any other kind of like caster can secret trick plays that you've been scheming up um Kassa can they let's see um the, I usually play um Asakin to play security to do um, these ground or escort operative and um, no one expects comms to be far forward so because usually the comms always um, give out APL and sit stationary so from second turning point I slowly start moving comms forward because I've already um, assigned him as escort operative then um, sometimes I just give out APL a third turning point only to move and dash fourth turning point just enough to score one victory point, but just enough to win. So people, people are always, um, caught up with some, um, um, tech ops, um, 
um, I think it has to do with uh, a lot of the tournaments having the secondaries as their tiebreaker that everyone wanted to max tech ops and um, give up on primaries. But sometimes the game gets um, gnarly enough that uh, one point will do it. So it's having the um, option to leave out the operative to score just enough to win that actually really um, um, sets the mood of the game. So um, I recommend um, using um, comms to not just give out APL, but move about and um, give more threat to your opponent. Really a big fan of the Mr.X over here, huh, Jay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> my, my, my crowd <laughs> knows <really laughs> very much about it uh, um, it's been sort of I'm diverting off a little bit but uh, um, Jason might have seen me um, um, in the chat recently but I'm right now trying to sell Phobos comms um, okay oh, I all right actually have said that. Yeah. you know we'll take we'll take another diversion into Phobos week you know it happens every week you know go ahead to give yes, us the yes. spiel on the comms on the comms infiltrator an operative that many I think have basically decided is terrible unless you're playing against exactly space marines or some other elites where you could drop the saboteur mine and then force it to go off at least i mean like every other elite faction has six activations but if you bring comms with it it becomes seven activations it's gonna be very limited but it's seven activations regardless so one thing that you could do is you could move your reaver surgeon move and dash pick up for free because you already played the vanguard and this is specifically um, Beta Decimar, actually. I um, should have mentioned that. Um, on the vantage objective that we talked about on the ground, and you, um, the smoke is um, um, now you, um, with your last action point, you pop up a smoke. And you can make your comms to loot that objective. Oh, and you tear it. I always forget to mention it. Um, so for anything that you lack, you can always ask the comms to um, support that idea. Um, everyone thinks I'm talking bollocks, but um, I have yet to fail with my comms what um, they are meant to do. And I, I'm always successful um, with comms on that very last action that will determine the, um, the, the, the um, direction of the game. Such as like like it's it's like breaches comms and escort operative. Everyone's been saying like escort operative is not a great tackle. I've scored it every single time. So I mean like I think um um one one of the great UK um breacher player who couldn't come to the Dan um he always seems to play escort operative with his breaches. So it's it's a similar idea in that sense. Um that. You can always score with something the opponent doesn't expect you to have. So, um, pack up choices as well. Um, it goes through, it's for all factions, I think. Everyone goes for recon and do recover item and vantage and their faction pack up. But if you do something else, then the opponent doesn't have a play because you don't, they don't know what you're doing. So you should be still be, um, thoughtful um and be honest and um uh um play with full of intent but you don't have to share your strategy or tactics so i think it comes down to um um balance between having a good intent and trying to juke the opponent And Jason, what do you feel about the uh, comms infiltration that really gets your opponent where they weren't expecting? You know, I noodled around with the comms and I haven't had a whole lot of success. Uh, there's a couple times I brought them, though. Like, if I'm going to bring a third infiltrator, I'll bring the comms. And then the reason for that is because I need one more body to stay hidden and run over and grab an objective. And then while it's while he's there, it might as well be someone that can omni scramble someone on the next turn. And then um, if he signals the sergeant to give me one extra command point on his way, on his way, uh, since this photo is such a, a CP hung team. So it'll just be like 
uh, pretty early on in the first turn, he will signal the sergeant to give the, me the CP so the sergeant can spend all three. He'll run over and um, just stay hidden and like loot or secure a point or something like that. And and then Omni scramble on someone on the next turn. And then after that, he's just a dork with lethal five. So I assume that you're using installed device at this point, then, if you're playing a comms, right, Jay? Oh, no, no, no. That, 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 that. That tech op needs to go away. Um, I, <laughs> what I would, <laughs> yeah, where, where, where's this comp? So where's this comp three so kill most... going? Yeah, but I mean so, that doesn't that doesn't matter about the comps, right? How does yeah. the comps help you no, get so, subversive control? <laughs> no, no, um, um, subversive control, gather surveillance, and shock and awe is is probably mm. the um the choice for uh, my infiltrate tech op on um forward striking because. No one expects comms to be like with all comms, not just Phobos. Um, 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 you expect them to do these actions. It's it's about at least our Phobos um, um, infiltrators can shoot on me for five. Um, gather surveillance on comms will be available because he'll be in a position where it doesn't need to be with. Let's Helix Adept is always going to be there. Um, so everyone will be at least three to six inches apart while comms can freely roam around. So it's 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 your reaver sergeant and your um comms who'd be doing a lot of the heavy lifting. That by the third turning point, the game will shift around um on BD and ITD specifically, um, open it um, a little harder that um, the game will shift to that um, um, you will infiltrate into one side of the opponent's territory and you would have given up um, um, your side of the territory and it will be um, either going clockwise or counterclockwise most of the time. So that's when comes shine that you can always do one more action just enough to not just to um, river um, sergeant strategize, but let's say um, you just need another loot to win, or you just need um, another um, fight action to um, um, lock the opponent or um, kill another operative. That's all possible if you have the comms available. So um, I've been I've been trying to um, sell this to everyone. Um, on Discord server, a lot of the times, no one seems to believe me, but I'm going to make this happen, and soon enough, comms will be the meta. The comms right. meta is just around the corner. <laughs> the misdirects are strong. I guess, you know, Jason is the resident Phobos player right now is going to have to give that one a try. I, I know I, I know very well about his five in curses. I, <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a great strategy. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm on board with that idea. And comms. Five increasers plus comms. <laughs> After you've double shot and your opponent's trying to respond to the obscurity, you know, flick him back to conceal. That actually sounds kind of juicy now, right, Ooh. Jason? Okay. Okay. Well, actually, I want to leave him on engage for more Overwatch. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, you know. If there, are there any uh, final calls you want to do? You know, final last calls to the tournament. We've got a tournament coming up on the 6th of April where we might get a small portion of the ticket proceeds that help the winner go to the World Championships. It sounds like three people who are already going to the World Championships are already going. So it means that you might not have to get first. You might be able to get away with second and still go to the World Championships, right? So I do not know what is going to happen to the existing golden tickets. But the winner of the tournament will get this golden ticket and the prize. Yeah. So In the past, just anyone, to, just to clarify, you yes, can always pass yes. your tickets down. So oh, really? you know, yeah, yeah. So you can always give it to the next person down. So if Alexa wins, he could definitely give his unpaid ticket from the last year's world championship over to the next player. Mm -hmm. That's not an issue, at least from the GW side, having done it a couple times. So right, right. That's good to know. Um, there was a few questions that was raised um, um, in um, in our community, so I just wanted to um, iterate that. Um, the more about the uh, the structure of the tournament, I just wanted to um, 
really get this down. So I forgot to miss it out. Um, so on what happens on day one is that people will um, swap their tables around specifically to play one particular terrain set. And what determines the, um, the top four places of the each pod, then they'll be the top cut and um, they'll, they'll only play with themselves um, on day two. Crazy. Um, and the rest of the people will, then it becomes a mixed board that they'll have to um, fight for best of the rest. Actually, forgot to mention that just the last time I was talking about it. So I wanted to let everyone know. Sounds like an exciting time for everyone in Australia who can make it. And if any international people are listening and have a trip coming to Australia in, you know, April 6th-ish range. So, you know, now's the time to go sign up. We'll have links to the tournament in our show notes, along with links to your your, um, store, which is... Can you remind us about the store name? Backed out gaming is the um, name Backed of the gaming. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And do you have a Discord, or do, is most of the Discord happening over at a uh, Good Times World? I know we've got our own Discord at Just Another Kill Team Discord, but where where can people find your team and the rest of the players that you are collaborating with? So we have a um, Facebook chat group that was uh, born out from um, Warhammer Chat Suits community chat group. And um, that uh, we were um, hard to find some resources that we often look about. So we actually have our own Discord server, Scale Issue. The link will be shared. Um, um, and hopefully um, Travis and Jason is kind enough to share that. Um, anyone can really join. And um, it. It's a very local Discord server. There's, um, it's not really about um, making. Um, um, uh, it's not really about growing the community, but it's become a bit of a database um, storage. And there are. It's it's really just a place to um, sit around and and know more about the kill team overall. Um, but you're more than welcome to join and, and share your ideas. All right, cool. We'll make sure that those links show up in our show notes. Jay, thank you very much for coming on, talking a little bit about Australian Kill Team and lots of stuff about Inquisition agents that I'm sure many players have not really conceived of because, you know, most people are playing security or some other or seek and destroy or some other stuff. So infiltration, double recon dashing, Kazukin and all that good stuff. Love to hear it. And listeners, thank you for uh, coming by and hopefully we'll catch you guys in the next one, right? Thank you guys. I appreciate it. It's been wonderful.